talk. Welcome everyone to this Water Institute Water Talk. My name is Roy Brouwer. I'm very happy to be here with you again today. We're going to have a water talk. Before I start introducing the speaker for today, I would like to start acknowledging that I'm participating today from ter traditional territories of the First People. I participate today from land that is part of the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee people. The University of Waterloo is located on land, as you can see on this map, granted to the six nations that include six miles on each side of the Grand River as part of the Haldeman Treaty. And the University of Waterloo and its centers and institutes like the Water Institute are committed to raise awareness and contribute to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls for, for action. And I invite you to consider briefly where you are at the moment. So having said that, welcome to the water talk. The procedure is, is as usual that we are going to have a presentation for 30, 40 minutes, um, and then we'll have time for questions. And um, please enter your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, but in the Q&A, and then we'll get to those questions after the presentation of today's speaker. I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Giuliano Di Baldessara, uh, to uh, you all. He is a professor of surface water hydrology and environmental analysis in the Department of Earth Sciences of Uppsala University in, in Sweden. He's been there for around eight years now, and before that he was at UNESCO IHE in Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Dibalda Sara is also the director of the Center of Natural Hazards and Disaster Science uh, in Sweden, which currently supports about 30 early career scientists in social engineering and earth sciences in three different Swedish universities. And his research program aims to understand how and why the interplay between social, technical, and physical processes can generate risks, crises, or disasters with a particular focus on droughts and floods. And in this context, Dr. D. Baldessari has led an interdisciplinary research group known as the Hydro Social Extremes, funded by the ERC, which is the European Research Council. Giuliano has been the recipient of numerous honors, including the Plinius Medal by the European Geosciences Union, the Thurius Prize by the Royal Society of Sciences in Uppsala, and the Witherspoon Lecture Award by the American Geophysical Union. Since 2013, Dr. Di Baldessara has been one of the leaders of the Pantare Global Research Initiative of the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, bringing together hundreds of scientists worldwide doing research on water and society. And he's published more than 150 articles, including several papers in multidisciplinary journals, such as Nature Sustainability, Science Advances, and Nature. And today's talk is going to be about droughts in a human-dominated world. Dr. Baldassara, we're very happy to have you with us today, and I'm happy to hand over the digital floor to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Roy. I will uh, start sharing the screen. And uh, you can let me know if um, if there are any technical issues. I'm assuming that you can uh, you can see the presentation. Yes. And welcome uh, to this um, um, to this seminar. I'm very excited to be here. I would like to thank the Water Institute at the Waterloo University for inviting me. And uh, as Rod said, I will uh, today uh, focus my presentation on uh, droughts in a human dominated world um, with a specific uh, uh, focus on uh, feedbacks, legacies and inequalities. And um, I also would like to thank Roy for uh, um, mentioning the um, uh, the, the Pantare initiative of the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, um, Pantare, Everything Flows. Uh, which has taken place over the past 10 years and has involved uh, numerous uh, scientists involved in uh, water resources. In this context, uh, um, on, only a few months ago, um, we, we published a, a paper on nature that, um, as you can see here, was co-authored by uh, multiple scientists from around the world and lay, led by um, the current chair of Pantare, Heidi Kreibich, in which we describe the challenge of unprecedented floods and drought risk management. And, um, and if, you, if you have the chance to look into this paper, um, I, I'm not gonna give the details, but essentially there is one 
good news, uh, which is probably sometimes good to start with uh, in, um, in uh, our context, uh, which is that um, many societies around the world have managed to reduce the impacts of ordinary droughts and floods. However, at the same time, we have a bad news, which is that uh, unprecedented events remain very challenges. And in fact, uh, we uh, are unable to uh, reduce their potential impact, uh, the associated losses and fatalities. And uh, there is increasing concern about these unprecedented floods and droughts, uh, considering uh, climate change and many other socioeconomic uh, changes that may make our society more exposed or more vulnerable to droughts and floods. One dimension that I will emphasize in, um, in this talk is that when we speak about hydrological extremes, floods and droughts, uh, nowadays they, we cannot think of them as merely natural or hydrological uh, hazards. They are strongly influenced by a number of human activities. Just as an example here, we can see, for instance, how global rivers around the world have been increasingly influenced uh, by the construction of dams and reservoirs that have altered the hydrological regime. As a result, the frequency, the intensity, and the spatial distribution of hydrological streams is heavily influenced by human activities. Dams and reservoirs are only one example of it, and probably they, it's, it's a kind of a deliberate influence of the hydrology, but there are also many other ways in which uh, human societies influence hydrological streams, which are not deliberate, for instance, land use change, urbanization, and deforestation, which are such that um, we, we need to account for the human impact when we study uh, these events. Uh, that's, that's why there have been uh, a lot of research um, within the hydrological community, um, and often under the umbrella of uh, the aforementioned uh, Panta Ray Initiative, in which we have been looking at drought in a human-dominated world. And um, there was um, here I just highlight a couple of uh, community papers which were written uh, around this topic, um, one led by Anfalun, a Drought in the Anthropocene, uh, which was published on Nature Geoscience, in which we speak about the fact that human activities may alleviate or exacerbate uh, hydrological drought, and, uh, and we need to better understand uh, human water interactions uh, to unravel the dynamics of droughts in a, a human dominated world. Uh, more recently, um, uh, there was another community paper led by Am Amira Gakoshak um, about anthropogenic drought, definition, challenges, and opportunities. Trying to summarize um, the, the way in which we think about drought in the Anthropocene, um, I, I, I made this diagram, which is based on the previous two papers with some uh, minor uh, changes. And uh, essentially, in the traditional hydrology, when we look into drought propagation, we, we, we used to focus on, uh, on this side, on the left-hand side, in which essentially climate variability may or may not uh, lead to the uh, occurrence of meteorological drought, uh, which is normally defined as, um, uh, for instance, precipitation uh, below normal conditions. And the meteorological drought may then, or not, uh, propagate through, um, uh, from, uh, from the air to the ground into agricultural and uh, hydrological drought with feedbacks, um, which are normally defined respectively as uh, soil that are drier than normal or river flows that are less than normal or lakes and water levels below uh, normal conditions. So, when, when we think in, in drought in terms of drought propagation, often uh, as a physical engineering scientists, we've been looking into this propagation and uh, from uh, uh, from the sky to the soil to the rivers, and also with a number of uh, a number of feedbacks, and and then look into different type of impacts that a, a, a drought can have. This may lead to energy crisis, food crisis. Um, in some instances, it may exacerbate. Uh, migration patterns and, uh, and existing uh, conflicts. 
However, what we try to emphasize is that when the drought propagates from the earth to the to our rivers, there are all a number of human activities that have an influence on this. First of all, uh, at the larger scale, uh, we have anthropogenic climate change, which is influencing climate variability. So we no longer have only natural climate variability, but anthropogenic climate change that may change the characteristics of um, of our climate and thus the frequency as well as the severity of meteorological drought. And then whether or not the meteorological drought result into uh, a, a strong impact on agriculture, on our rivers, uh, it strongly depends on different human activities. We have land use changes uh, and uh, irrigation patterns, which may alleviate droughts in some places, but exacerbate elsewhere. The same with dams and reservoirs with different impacts if you are upstream or downstream the dams and also depending on the reservoir operational rules, water abstraction, all these type of activities have an influence on this propagation. And this type of influence can not, not, not only be seen as an external forcing into the propagation of drought, because the impact of drought also produces some human responses. So society respond to drought and they can change those human activities. So land use change, changing practices of irrigation, making, for instance, irrigation more efficient, um, changing operations for reservoirs, building new dams, and all this will again influence the propagation of drought. So the, the, the challenge here is to capture these two-way interactions between the water and the human systems. And um, one way to do this, um, uh, which we have been uh, uh, pursuing over the past years, is to integrate multiple research methods with the overall goal of unraveling uh, human drought uh, interactions. And um, to do this, we, we, we use a combination of research methods, since each method has some pros and some cons, but by combining them together, we can advance our knowledge. Um, in particular, we, we use a combination of um, social hydrological models, which could be the, of different types, system dynamics, agent-based models, or integrated couple models. Um, we, we use multiple case studies and uh, to, to, to look more into the details, into the primary mechanism uh, that determine interactions and feedbacks and generate uh, different type of um, uh, phenomena. And, uh, and lastly, we also do large scale analysis or global analysis to see whether a specific uh, dynamic can be generalized and under which conditions can be generalized. So today I will, um, as I said, I will focus on, uh, on drought in a human dominated world. So I will primarily speak about the human drought interactions. And uh, as examples, I will show a case study related to the city of Cape Town in South Africa. And um, for large scale analysis, I will speak about the legacy of dams in the uh, continuous uh, United States. <clears throat> Just a, a bit about the conceptualization of uh, human drought interactions. So this is this is just an example of the way in which um, human societies around the world respond to the occurrence of water shortage. So we define water shortage as a condition in which um, water supply uh, cannot meet water demand, and. Um, and this can be driven, for instance, by the occurrence of a drought. Uh, with a water shortage, normally we have some economic losses, which can put increased public pressure to, to do some action. And we see that in many contexts, um, the type of action which, is, which often uh, is considered very popular is to expand reservoir storage by changing uh, reservoir operational rules, building new dams, depending on the local context. So the idea is to increase water supply to meet water demand. And, and of course, we have socioeconomic trends for water demand and agroclimatic trends for water supply, which may be to some extent treated as externality. So what we have been arguing over the years is that uh, this type of approach uh, may lead to a number of unintended consequences, which are here um, simplified in terms of two types of phenomena. 
The first one, which is what we call supply demand cycle, which is that um, by increasing water supply, uh, we enable agricultural growth or industrial expansion and uh, urbanization, uh, which may um, enable increasing water demand, quickly offsetting the benefits in terms of um, the benefits of expanding reservoir storage. So the supply demand cycles lead to a process of increasing water supply, the increasing demand is a kind of chicken and egg dynamic. Moreover, by increasing water supply, we uh, tend to increase the dependency of the system on, uh, on uh, the availability of water resources, which make the system more vulnerable to water shortages, so that when the water shortage occurs, economic losses are uh, much larger. So, if we think of the two dynamics together, what is happening is that with supply demand cycle, we lose the benefits of expanding reservoir storage, while at the same time, we make the system more vulnerable with respect to drought. So in, um, we have been discussing different type of examples related to this type of uh, dynamics. And um, I will just show uh, some macro um, uh, macroscopic ma macro trend analysis that we have been doing on the contiguous um, United States, um, where, um, as you may know, uh, the, over the past 150 years, we see that both the center of human population as well as the center of dams and reservoirs has been moving towards the West. In fact, the center of dams um, uh, is, uh, is very close to the geographical center of the United States. And, um, uh, and this is the result of a number of processes um, that, that I will uh, summarize with this diagram. So in, in this diagram, what we see is the in, um, in increasing population on the United States and, uh, and also how uh, the volume of dams have been increasing over time. And then we, we identified by analyzing, by doing a micro scale analysis of uh, uh, the water demands and water supply in the United States, we identified in a, in a recent paper, three different phases, uh, which we call the Go West Young Men on the 19th century, um, in which we see population growth being faster than the increasing volume of reservoirs. And then we have a period known as the hydraulic mission in which um, we see that the volume of reservoirs is growing faster than the growing population of the United States. So this was a period of um, strong reliance of water infrastructure uh, to, uh, to meet a growing water demand. And then we have a more recent phase, which is called as plateau phase from the 1980s, in which essentially uh, the volume of the total volume of dams is kind of constant. Some dams are also being dismissed. And, uh, but what happens is that we have reached a level of water supply, which is uh, uh, very difficult to sustain. And that during um, uh, drought conditions may lead to uh, groundwater exploitation. So there have been um, a number of authors that uh, have been arguing that water infrastructure has been primarily a response uh, to uh, water demands. However, in the literature also quite a number of uh, scholars have argued uh, the opposite relationship that water infrastructure is actually driven uh, this uh, unsustainable grow growth, uh, which has led to uh, uh, overconsumption of uh, water resources. So we're trying by looking at the United States and also by focusing on the Southwest region of Arizona and, uh, and California uh, to, to, to try to arrive at this egg and chicken uh, problem. Uh, for instance, by using among other methods, um, some uh, uh, lag uh, correlation methods in which we try to test whether water supply can be considered as a predictor for water use and vice versa, the water use as a predictor of water supply. And what we found out that none of those uh, hypotheses can really be rejected. So we do have uh, uh, a strong interplay uh, between uh, the two. Um, <clears throat> so, 
to, to integrate this macroscopic analysis, we also try to look into more uh, specific case studies. So to, to follow up on the supply demand uh, cycles, I will refer now to a, a specific uh, case study, uh, which is the case of um, the day zero water crisis in uh, Cape Town. So um, in, uh, in the early 2018, after uh, three years of drought, um, the city of Cape Town uh, was high up in the global news uh, since there was uh, concern that the city could run out of water. Date zero was identified in uh, some days in February 2018 as a day in which the city, there would not be any water in the reservoir to uh, supply the city. If we look into this specific study, um, I can uh, show here into the map, we have the city of Cape Town and the Western Cape water supply system, which consists of a, a complex system of dams, which, which were primarily built in the, in the 70s. So we see that uh, in the 70s, there has been increasing storage capacity, uh, which has, um, uh, which was meant um, to secure uh, water supply uh, for the Cape Town uh, region. And, um, and the availability of these water resources has enabled increasing water consumption over time. Um, and also, um, if, we, if we look into, the, uh, into annual rainfall in, uh, into, the, into the region, we can see that there were a number of uh, drought um, events um, well before the day zero, but they did not produce any water crisis because reservoirs did the job they are intended to do, which is to buffer uh, this um, um, hydrometeorological uh, vari variability and, uh, and provide a sufficient amount of water also in period of droughts. And this gave the impression that Ca Cape Town was drought proof uh, thanks to the Western Cape uh, water supply system. However, uh, when from 2015 to 2018 we had a, a multi-year drought, uh, then in this case the volume of reservoir was no longer sufficient to attenuate uh, such a uh, such a, uh, these drought conditions, and the reservoirs were running out of water. And we can see that there was a drop in water consumption due to the uh, need to introduce very strict um, water restrictions. So what we see also here in this specific case are those supply demand cycles uh, driven by the construction of the Western Cape uh, water supply systems, which has put the city into a locking conditions of strong reliance on water resources, um, which becomes very vulnerable when um, prolonged and major drought occurs. We also see something that I mentioned before as reservoir effects. Um, this stain is takes from the a similar levy effect, which is broadly known in the flood risk community. Uh, in this case, it's because the, the presence of reservoirs attenuate hydrological variability. So we've seen that minor droughts did not result into water crisis, which is the intended benefit of reservoirs. But then they delay salient information in the response when major events occur such as in the case of day zero. And we've seen similar dynamics also in the context of you know, California or in, uh, in Australia with the millennium drought and in many other places around the world. And the concern is that, um, this, that we, we see may, more and more countries um, in uh, emerging economies that are uh, proposing the construction of new dams and reservoirs. And, uh, and the, uh, the idea here is not to say no to this, uh, to this expansion of dams and reservoirs, but to be aware that uh, we, besides the intended benefits, we have a number of unintended consequences that may, uh, may uh, emerge in the, in the long term that one can try to anticipate. Cape Town also enables to discuss another aspect um, um, of, um, of this presentation, which is the aspect of uh, inequality. So when I've been speaking, so far I've been speaking about uh, human water interactions and um, I haven't, uh, um, I've been considering society uh, as if society was uh, uh, some kind of uh, single entity, aggregated entity. Uh, in the real world, uh, society is heterogeneous and, um, and different social groups have different possibility to 
prevent, uh, cope with, and recover from hydrological streams, and in particular, droughts. Cape Town is a very extreme event. We can see this picture, which very nicely depicts uh, the contrast between the rich area uh, in which the elite lived in uh, villas with swimming pools and uh, uh, irrigated gardens, uh, while on the other side, uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, informal uh, settlements, uh, which people in which families uh, can get uh, about 40 liters per family per day. So just the minimum amount of water to uh, survive. <clears throat> so in this context, we have been uh, um, modeling uh, human drought uh, in the interactions and see um, how um, the diff uh, by, by considering the, the type of um, uh, positive and negative feedbacks between different variables, hydrological, uh, technical, and social variables. So this is uh, actually a, a new result. The paper was just... Uh, accepted um, and uh, and I'm presenting here the, the key uh, message. So in, in this model, we try to capture this type of interaction and, and account explicitly for different, different social groups that have different possibility to benefit from water infrastructure and also uh, different capacities to, um, uh, to deal with the occurrence of droughts. And um, we apply this model to Cape Town and here we can see uh, we have different five social groups were identified and the, the elite. And then we have um, uh, the middle class, which was divided into upper middle income, lower middle income. And then we have the low income cl class and finally uh, informal dwellers, people that live in informal settlements. And what we can see is that the daily household uh, water consumption is strongly different uh, when we consider these different groups. And especially when it comes to amenities, we have major differences, which are quite substantial part of water consumption for the elite and absent for, uh, uh, for informal dwellers and low income groups. Um, this type of models uh, not only enable us to make hypotheses that we can test, but also to explore different type of scenario. So what we did by using this model was to to try to simulate uh, the multi-year dr drought in, a, in, a, in Cape Town and see how this is going to affect uh, the level of water consumption uh, by considering different scenarios. The, the, the black line here is the baseline, which is essentially what uh, happened. Um, uh, is kind of simulating the historical patterns of private water uh, use. Uh, and then we have the different lines in which we essentially we simulate scenarios in which we have a uh, bigger population in Cape Town. Uh, we have scenario of climate change, of altered precipitation, uh, uh, decreased inflow and increased temperature. Uh, and then uh, different scenarios in terms of um, uh, level of water consumption. So whether this is more equal and sustainable or even more unequal. And uh, what we found out uh, is that uh, um, unsustainable uh, water consumption by the elite um, has had a major, uh, is a major role in uh, driving water crisis, which is at least as concerning as um, uh, climate change. Um, okay, this brings me to some uh, um, discussion and conclusions on the study of uh, human water systems, and in particular on the study of drought in, uh, in the Anthropocene. Um, so as I've been trying to, uh, to describe in this presentation, human water interactions are complex and there are different dimensions that uh, one could look at. Um, in, this, um, in this presentation, I emphasize the role of feedbacks between social and hydrological processes, uh, inequalities due to the heterogeneity of both hydrological and social processes, uh, and lastly, also the legacies. So the decisions of the past uh, are essentially the, 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 the legacy we have today, which also means that today's decisions are, is gonna be the legacy for the future. And, um, and when we make these decisions, for instance, such as expanding water infrastructure, um, while this is a legitimate de decision, we should be aware that while in the short term, uh, intended benefits may be more visible in the long term, we can have a number of unintended consequences as the one I've showed here. 
one aspect um, uh, also of, of the study is that uh, models alone or the analysis of data alone cannot entirely capture the complexity of human water interaction. We definitely need to go beyond what uh, can be quantified. And, and that's why uh, we always use case studies to complement models and uh, uh, let's say geographical spatial temporal analysis of um, uh, hydrological and social data. And uh, this is particularly true in the, in the context of human water interactions. In particular, we have uh, two aspects that we need to account for. One, which is human behavior, which is um, influencing uh, the way in which uh, people make decisions. So we have decision makers, politicians, policy makers that make decisions and they have an influence on the system, but also uh, people on the ground that are affected, they, they also have their behavior and depending on that, the impact is strongly influenced. And uh, the second aspect is the aspect of power, power relationship and, uh, and politics, which uh, has an influence on uh, what type of social groups are going to benefit and which one are having um, uh, uh, cost when we introduce new water infrastructure or when we um, face uh, drought events. And um, when we bring together quantitative and qualitative um, uh, information, uh, very often uh, we cannot be very precise in, uh, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our results. Um, but here I, I like this quote by John Tucky, uh, which this is quite a, a, an old one, uh, but it's kind of driving our research, which um, I strongly believe this is, this is a, a great point made, far better an approximate answer to the right question uh, than the exact answer to the wrong question. Um, so the point here is that um, we, can, we can indeed keep on uh, analyzing um, drought by focusing only on the physical processes of it, uh, this may enable us to be very accurate and precise, but we are neglecting an important part of the propagation of drought, uh, as I try to, to show. So the humans are there in the system, and, uh, and the, I strongly believe that there is a need to put in humans into the equation. And one way to do this is to, uh, to, do, to continuously have an iterative process in which we update models, by drawing from case studies and large scale analysis and uh, to better understand the feedback mechanism and the type of dynamics we, that may generate and under which circumstances that they, they can generate. So normally a type of uh, uh, criticism that this type of study may, may, may get is that, well, but you are trying to predict human behavior. I mean, humans are unpredictable. Now, the thing is that um, if, we, if we neglect the human impact, we are also making a, a, an assumptions about human behavior. Either we are assuming that essentially they do, we, not, we people don't exist in the propagation of drought. This could be one assumption. Or we probably make the assumption that people keep behaving always the same way and that society is a single entity uh, where cost and benefit are equally shared everywhere which is also a very strong assumption. Or thirdly, uh, we make, which is also quite common optim in optim optimization studies, we assume that all people are rational decision makers. Nowadays, we have a potential to, to improve this. And to improve this, we need to include um, uh, aspects that come from the behavioral science, the political sciences that enable us to better account for the role of awareness, power, and how this influence human water interactions. And, uh, and what I've been trying to show here is that uh, uh, by advancing uh, our understanding uh, of human water systems, we can draw also different scenarios of unprecedented events. So we can analyze, for instance, what may happen in one place if some extreme event of unprecedented magnitude is going to happen and, uh, and trying to see what type of trajectory we may expect by considering the different feedbacks, the legacies of previous decisions, and the inequalities that are in place. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Giuliano. That was great. That was really very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> and very good to, to get some more insight in, in how these social hydrological models um, work that you've been working on. 
we have time for, for questions. So if anyone who's online has a question for Giuliano, please enter it in the Q&A box and then we'll get to that. I'll, I'll kick it off, uh, Giuliano, if you don't mind. So I, I very much like this, this emphasis on, on human behavior. Um, <clears throat> and as, as, as an economist, um, we, we, we're obviously very interested in, in finding out how, how people respond to, to the use of economic policy instruments, for example. So what, my, my question to you is a little bit related to what you were saying um, or what I heard you say before about the dam building in the U.S. that you say that, you know, we, we don't want to stop it, but we want to make people aware of the negative, possible negative consequences that you actually uh, push demand um, uh, up. Um, as a result of increasing the availability, and, and so what, what I was wondering about is 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 how how do you then um, introduce policy instruments or policies to 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 uh, ensure that that doesn't actually happen? So what, once you've 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 figured out that these that these correlations exist, that these uh, relationships exist, and, and that it might actually go um, in a direction where you where you actually wanted to steer it away from, I, I wonder a little bit how in your models you account or introduce uh, water policy uh, uh, interventions and, and, and how do you then uh, perhaps um, uh, predict uh, or try to predict how, 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 how um, water consumption um, might, might stay the same or might even go down if, if possible. Right. Yes. Thanks for the question. This is really, uh, really relevant. Um, so what we we try to so the the point here was trying to make uh, more realistic uh, assumptions about um, uh, supply demand uh, cycles. And in terms of policy, uh, what we could see by analyzing historical data is that when there has been large investment in uh, introducing new water infrastructure and securing water supply. Uh, this has um, somehow prevented uh, the uh, policies for the uh, demand to, to manage the demand. And, um, and I must say that uh, from, my, from my point of view, I, you know, I, I look at this uh, more like uh, in terms of policy alternatives. So what we see is that in, in, in terms of decision-making process, we can, we can make the assumption, okay, we are gonna build the dam, but then we are also going to you know, control the demand. But we haven't seen this happening very strongly. It's also in the flood risk community, you can you know, build levees and probably the Netherlands is the most striking example. And then you can say, we, we will try to you know, reduce exposure on flood prone areas. But as soon as these areas become more desir desirable, then you have investments and, uh, and uh, you have more people living in floodplain in the same way in which as soon as more water is available, uh, you have more activities. And you, uh, we we have, don't have many examples in which this could have been stopped. And again, there are two reasons here. Uh, well, there are multiple reasons for that, but the, the primary mechanism, uh, one is related to the, you know, primarily the, the human behavior, both of people and decision makers. And secondly, also the, in, a, you know, in, a, in, a, in, in our economies, uh, as soon as there is something which is profitable, uh, there, is, there, are, there are interests to exploit that. I mean, we, economic growth remain one of the main goals of our society. And uh, so one may argue that yes, supply demand cycle has made us probably more vulnerable to drought, but some may also argue that this has also made us richer in the same way in which one could say, you know, like in relation to floods, uh, if you think about the Netherlands, uh, you know, uh, the probability of flooding is very, very low, but in case of flooding is catastrophic, but one could say that by urbanizing the floodplain, we, there has been uh, wealth, uh, economic growth since floodplain offer favorable conditions for economic development. So there are very often kind of, it's more about trade-off. And what we try to do with our models, rather than saying, okay, you should do this and that, is trying to kind of more like, uh, trying to show what type of dynamics may emerge once that water infrastructure is put in place. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Giuliano. Um, in the meantime, we've, we've, we've got questions from, from the audience. So I'm gonna start with the first one from Julian, Julian Song. Um, so he thanks you for your presentation. Um, and then he asks you, when it comes to informing decision makers, how can we communicate this cascading uncertainties of integrating human behavior to drought adaptation policies? 
Yes, thanks for the question. This is the, the, the communication is a is a is a is a major um, is a major aspect here. Uh, as I speak, I'm also part of a of a conference here in Spain in which we uh, we uh, engage in a number of uh, case studies around the world uh, with different decision makers uh, to uh, when it, when it comes to drought and water scarcity, and. Um, and I would say that uh, decision makers um, are aware of uh, human behavior, probably uh, to some extent, sometimes even more than academics. Uh, so that, that that's 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 an aspect that won't surprise them. And um, and uh, when, when whenever you know, also when it comes to politicians, they know that uh, narratives shape. Uh, uh, public discourses, they have an important role to avoid policy resistance. So that's something that normally we can communicate quite well, uh, since most people can uh, can relate to that. Uh, and we can build, uh, as also Roy mentioned, I mean, economics has been doing this for, for decades. And, you know, we have behavioral economics, but not only, I mean, the accounting for human behavior is not something new, it's primarily what, what, is, what we're trying to do is to do it explicitly uh, when it comes to uh, to droughts. Thanks. Um, so uh, Don Ciparis has a question as well, but, but but Don, I'm not sure if I completely understand what your what your question is. So he, he's uh, he's also thanking you for your presentation, uh, Giuliano. Um, he's he's asking: Is an effective conservation ethic a mostly Western problem? Uh, and then this is the part that I'm not completely sure about: is or can it be implemented by the by by the West? Um, yeah. So, so if you try to interpret this, yeah, so oh, I don't know if Don wants to. The first part is, is, yeah, is, it, no, is yeah. it mostly a Western I think, problem? Yeah. So um, I would say that the, the dynamics have showed, um, uh, we, uh, for instance, in the US are, are, are typical for Western econo uh, economies. And, uh, and we, we can see that in multiple contexts, not only for droughts, also for floods. Uh, 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 Western countries have realized that uh, we have reached some kind of level of unsustainable water consumption. And there are efforts to reduce water demands. Um, so my point is that by analyzing this type of trajectory, we can also look at emerging economies and we could try to inform them uh, that, you know, if you follow this path, we may end up with uh, similar issues, so levels of unsustainable water consumption. And, uh, and then I think, I mean, we have democratic process. I'm the last one that should tell the others what to do or what not to do. But it's, it's a way to inform other economies that uh, this is the kind of pathways, and this is the legacy you're going to have. So probably one can think twice before following uh, similar trajectories, since alternatives are being uh, explore, uh, explored in, in other places. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so Don, I hope that answered your your, your question. Um, I'm going to move to Ajar. Ajar Sharma is is also thanking you for your presentation, and and he's asking in the causal lo loop diagram that you showed, how how do we examine the self correcting loops that further exacerbate the system's water demand? Um, so it's a bit maybe related to what I was asking you before as well. How relevant is the discussion? He then also asks about the institutional path dependencies that inherently prevent any changes to the system. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, that's uh, one way to do that is to, uh, so there are different aspects here. One is more descriptive. So when we, um, the, there, there are a number of, uh, a number of primary mechanisms that um, explain why by increasing water supply, we often see, not always, but mo most cases we see increasing uh, water demand. And some of those are de deliberate. I mean, sometimes we, I mean, we increase water supply because, because we, we expect increasing water demand. So it's not always easy to, to find and explain what are the drying mechanisms. Uh, but, but yeah, again, as I mentioned before, we, we see that uh, besides the intentional aspect, there are some unintended, which primarily comes from uh, human behavior and uh, political processes. So the, the, in, uh, in most, most economies, uh, that push uh, economic growth, uh, they have this type of effect. There are also a slightly different aspect, which is more like a rebound effect, also broadly known in economics, um, uh, when, uh, when a system becomes more 
efficient, uh, this may be rebound, and, uh, but this doesn't necessarily offset the original benefits. So then it depends on, uh, on, on there are different, uh, different levels of rebound that uh, one may, may have. Yeah. Um, in terms of path dependency, yeah, I mean, that's definitely, I mean, th th this was one of the point here is that as soon as you start relying on, uh, on water infrastructure, you get into a path dependency. And, uh, and I mean, there are ways to get out of it. I mean, in the Netherlands, there have been a sample of leaving, um, you know, room for the river in which some of those levees were um, uh, lowered or even removed. So to give floodplain back to nature, but these were more like isolated cases. Uh, one cannot say, you know, uh, Dutch people should go and live in Limbo. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, uh, so it's very, oh, in California, I mean, now the, the, the level of, I mean, in California, the, the per capita water consumption has decreased. So there are ways to decrease that, but the overall water consumption is a very high level and it's very difficult to put that further down. And so once you, you reach that level, uh, is very difficult to to change. So you have path dependency, which may end up into a locking condition or a very difficult to unlock condition. Thank, thank you, Giuliano. Um, John John Quilty is is uh, also thanking you for his presentation, and he's actually watching the presentation with his grad class um, on, on water management, and and um, uh, they found the result that you presented about the elite. Uh, that that had the largest impact on droughts. They found that very interesting and insightful. And, and he's asking, are you aware of any scenarios from your case studies where the elite have reduced their impact on the water systems to improve water availability for the lower classes? Yeah, so in the context of Cape Town, during the drought conditions, in absolute term, the elite had to reduce um, the water consumption quite strongly. Um, in 2017, I, I even showed that diagram uh, today, but um, uh, it has been um, uh, a very, very relevant um, uh, decrease. Uh, however, um, uh, what, uh, what happened is that as soon as the drought finished, then uh, the elite went not only back to the previous level of water consumption, but even higher than that. Because what happened is that during the drought, in the case of Cape Town, uh, people in the elite, uh, since there were water restriction, they uh, were drilling new boreholes and wells to get groundwater. So now on top of the water that already had, they also have these additional sources of water. It, it is something very, uh, very important, I think, because also in the context of uh, uh, climate change, CO2 emissions, we see, uh, you know, that the top 1% uh, as a, a consumption of environmental resources and also emissions, which is higher than the low 50%. So if, if there are examples, positive examples of re, uh, uh, long-term reduction of consumptions from the lead, that would be great, but I haven't uh, come across on, on my career. As I said, on, the only case was Cape Town, but only during the drought. As soon as the drought was finished, while the lower class went below uh, the pre-drought uh, level of water security, the elite is even consuming more. Yeah. So if I, if I may very briefly add, so what you, what, what, what you can uh, see in terms of uh, economic policy instruments globally is, is that um, um, what used to be a very popular uh, uh, water rate uh, structure is decreasing water rates ha has been changed to increasing uh, block rates. Um, and the, the idea behind that was also e equity, basically, that people uh, who are rich consume large uh, amounts of water and so they should be paying more for their for their water as well. A lot of economists have disputed that actually. They 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 disagree with with that change. Uh, so nowadays most of the the block rates are increasing, um, and and it's very often based on these equity uh, considerations. Whereas economists have been arguing that um, you 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 have to look at the the costs. You you look at the costs of providing the water. Um, and that should drive the, the 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 water rate. Anyway, that's just as an aside. Um, then we have Julian again, Julian Sohn. So he 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 says um, uh, paramount to water security is is human society participation in all aspects of thinking and developing drought adaptation measures. 
And then he asks you for your opinion, how well are you currently doing to involve people's society in the decision-making process? Or maybe not you, but just generally, how, 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 how well are we doing? I think we are doing better. Uh, I wouldn't say we are doing well, but um, we are doing better. Uh, as I mentioned, as a speaker, I'm part of this conference on, uh, on uh, in which we have a large project in Europe on, uh, on water scarcity. And uh, when we speak about these models, uh, we speak more and more about co-production and co-development of models. Um, the idea is to involve uh, stakeholders and uh, uh, communities, as well as decision makers from the very beginning of uh, of the of the process of building um, uh, models for water resources management i mean this is not something new this has been going on for 30 40 years but it has become more and more common and uh, and uh, and we can see that by building trust and um, with the uh, with, with the stakeholders we can we can also achieve and make the model much more uh, useful uh, for them and uh, have a stronger message when um, when we interact with them so I wouldn't say we are doing well, but we are doing better years by years. Thank you, Juliana. Um, James Peters is, is asking um, whether you have an opinion on uh, engaging the general public by introducing and encouraging the use of recycling bins for water to encourage and remind everyone to use less and to use water twice, utilizing our 40 years of history and accepting of other recycling efforts. Um, and then he goes on to say that we domestically manufacture the first ones made from recycled recycling bins that are traditionally burned. So what he's asking you is, is I don't know if you know this initiative, recycling bins for water, um, to, to raise awareness and engage the public. Yeah, I, I don't know this initiative in particular, but I think raise awareness, which was one of the, you know, this primary mechanism that they try to focus on. Uh, it, it's really it's really important in engaging with the public because at the end, um, especially in a democracy, is the public which uh, will somehow influence the decision making process. And if we don't engage with the public, if the public is not voting for politicians that, for instance, have more interest to protect water resources or the environment, then uh, I mean we can write nice papers, but we, we are not going to have an impact. So I. Uh, I, I, I I totally agree. I mean, that's really important. And I, I would like to know about this initiative. Uh, it's a very nice title. Okay, thank you. James, maybe you can you can provide a link in the chat if, if there is a link to a, a website. Yeah. Thank you, Juliana. So the, I, I'm going to take the last question. And the last one is from Foluque Areola. Um, he also thanks you for your presentation, Giuliano. Giuliano. Um, he, he's talking about the independent unintended consequences, which uh, include migration. Could you throw some light on this in terms of economic losses and emotional effects on people? Yeah, I mean, the, when it, yeah, in general, when, uh, when it comes to natural hazards, um, and, and this may apply uh, to some extent also to drought, um, uh, we have patterns of human mobility that uh, can or cannot be influenced by their occurrence. So very often migration is the result of multiple factors, economic factors, religious factors, um, but there are contexts in which, for instance, the occurrence of a prolonged drought may make, uh, may provide more incentives to, uh, you know, probably to, to a family of farmers to move to the city, accelerate the urbanization process. And indeed, this comes uh, with a number of uh, issues in terms of, uh, 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 especially when it comes to emotional effects on, on people. This is normally something that we don't quantify when we quantify, you know, economic losses, fatalities, but these emotional effects, uh, you know, I myself, I, I come from a city in Italy, which was affected by a major earthquake in 2009. And, and indeed, there were huge economic losses and fatalities, but I... I can still that or, or still now in 2023 after 14 years I I see some of my relatives are still strongly emotionally affected by that event. And that's something we don't normally account explicitly in our model, but that's yet another reason why I think we need to have somewhere uh, consideration of those more qualitative aspects around the natural hazards and in particular drought. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I I I, I actually uh, heard that um, 
um, sort of stern review on policy and action related to climate change and, and the impacts that climate change had, for example, on the frequency of, of floods and so on. Um, so they typically, in their economic analysis, account for material damage costs, so like loss of houses, properties, etc. And I once uh, heard that the estimated immaterial damage costs, so like emotional, um, uh, 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 this social disruption, um, emotional stress, etc., that 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 is at least as high. Um, if I, I think there were some people trying to quantify that in monetary terms, was at least as high as the. Uh, as the, as the material costs. Um, so I, I'm afraid we, we will have to um, stop here. Um, uh, Dr. Baldassare also has to go back to his conference at, at exactly um, 11 a.m. our time, uh, which, would, which would be 5 p.m. I think where, where he is in Spain. So um, Giuliano, thank you so much once again for, for giving the presentation. Thank you also for taking the time to answer the different questions that, um, that your presentation um, generated. We were very happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for your interesting presentation. Um, and, and, and we hope to stay in touch with you. Good luck with your presentation um, and the conference in, in the coming days in, in, um, in Spain. And I'd like to say to the audience, thank you for participating. And I'm um, happy to invite you to our next water talk, which is already in two weeks time on March the 2nd, um, it's going to be in person in the DC Center, DC 1302, and we're going to have Professor Amy Kraft with us. She's a professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa, and she is the University Research Chair there in Indigenous Governance in relationship with land and water. So we look forward to see you in person in two weeks' time, March the 2nd at 11.30 a.m. in DC um, 1302. Thank you all for participating today. Giuliano, once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Roy, thank, thank you. you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, your questions and for attending. Very nice discussion. And also for the links. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. You saw the link, right, Giuliano? Yeah. Yeah? OK. Thank you. Thank you, James, for sending the link. Bye, everyone. <laughs>